and Princeton University in the United States. Dr. Holly is interested in the physics of strongly correlated electron systems, quantum phase transitions, heavy fermions, topological materials, metallic magnetism, superconductivity, ferroelectricity, anti-ferroelectricity, and the development of quantum technologies. And today we will talk about superconductivity mediated by polar modes in doped ferroelectrics. So thank you again, Priscilla and Stephen. So it's a pleasure to have you both here today. So I think we start. Oh, okay. Thank you very much, Chris, for the kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be, well, virtually here. Um, today I'm going to talk about some of the mysteries of uranium tellurium too. I'm not going to be able to cover all of them, um, but I'll try my best to cover uh, four. Uh, here's the outline of my talk. I'll start by uh, briefly introducing topological superconductivity and the newly discovered material uh, uranium tellurium II. Uh, then I'll, I'll um, mention several insights from uh, recent measurements under pressure. Uh, the reference can be found here and it was actually um, formally accepted 30 minutes ago in Science Advances. So it's really, really fresh, uh, freshly accepted. And uh, I'll end with an outlook and outstanding questions in the field. Uh, so let me see. So let me start by telling you that spin triplet superconductors are currently a route for topological superconductivity. But what is topological superconductivity? Well, we need to go back a little bit uh, to topology in mathematics. Uh, so topology is a major area in mathematics concerned with spatial properties that are preserved under continuous uh, deformation. So in this case here, uh, a donut, for example, can be continuously deformed into a mug. So that means they are topologically uh, the same. So we have topological invariants that can classify uh, objects in different uh, classes. More recently, this concept was extended to condensed matter physics. So now we need to look at the band structure and calculate the topological invariant. And in, in the case of a simple uh, uh, system with inversion symmetry and no time reversal symmetry breaking, we can calculate the so-called Z2 index, which is just a, um, a product of the parity at high symmetry uh, points of the Brillouin zone. So in this case here, we have on the left side a uh, band structure that is trivial, and in the right side, a uh, bending version that leads to top uh, topological insulating state. And this state has um, um, protected spin textures uh, on its surface, um, and also um, a possibly proximity effects when in, in proximity to an S-wave superconductor, for example. Uh, people have been looking for topological superconductivity in heterostructures with this proximity effect. And why is that? Well, people want to, to or they're searching uh, for the so-called Majorana fermions that may exist in this uh, interface. And uh, these uh, particles, which are uh, very exotic, they are their own antiparticles, and they have been uh, argued to be possibly uh, a, a candidate for quantum qubits, for example. So there is a, a, a race to, to find these exotic particles, but another route, uh, instead of using proximity effects, which is pretty uh, complicated in some ways, um, another route is actually to try to find um, uh, topological superconductors instead of um, uh, creating them through proximity. And just like in the case we just discussed, one can also define topological numbers uh, for the occupied states uh, in, in superconductors, but things are a little bit more complicated in this case. Um, we need to know um, a, a lot of um, uh, information from experiments. We need to know whether the material breaks time reversal or not, whether we are in 1D, 2D, or 3D, and depending on all these parameters, we may have different topological invariants. And also to complicate things further, nodes may also have their own topological uh, classification. 
But experimentally, at least, let's take a step back. We have a, a guideline because we know that spin triplet superconductors uh, often occur in uranium-based materials. So uh, let's take a step back and experimentally determine the superconducting order parameter, which is really essential for this classification scheme, uh, the presence of time reversal symmetry, the uranium valence uh, in its localization and its Fermi surface. It, look, it, it sounds simple, but actually this is a very, very complicated task. Uh, but we're going to go through some of these uh, properties in a newly discovered uh, contender. So here's uranium tellurium 2. It's been discovered, well, it's a known compound. It has been known for a long time, uh, but very recently has been discovered by Nicholas uh, Butch's group in, in Maryland that it's actually superconducting at low temperatures. So I would like to start with the structure of the system. I, it always gives us a lot of insights. Uh, and, and this structure is orthorhombic, so a little bit more complicated than what we may uh, like, uh, but it makes things interesting as well. So here we have space group 71. Interestingly, uh, uranium, uh, the uranium-uranium distance is here. The shortest one is, is in this uranium-uranium dimers along the C-axis that stagger uh, in like a ladder fashion. And along the A-axis, we have these nice uh, chains. So here are the normal state properties published in this uh, science paper at the bottom. Uh, here it's a magnetization, it's an isotropic as you would expect from an orthorhombic material. The A-axis has a, a larger uh, magnetic susceptibility telling us that the A-axis is uh, perhaps the easy axis of magnetization. Uh, resistivity is also an isotropic in the high temperatures. We have uh, an incoherent state of weakly correlated moments and at low temperatures uh, they hybridize. At least that's what we believe so far. Uh, the superconducting um, properties are over here. So we can see that the resistance goes to zero. Uh, per perhaps the offset is 1.5. The midpoint is 1.6 Kelvin. It also has a diamagnetic signal and magnetic susceptibility. Uh, the heat capacity is you know, very interesting um, by itself. Here we have a clear bulk superconducting transition, but at low temperatures, we don't have an exponential form, but a power law, which is again an indication of um, a, not an S wave, a simple S wave superconductor. Interestingly though, um, at, at very low temperatures, the extrapolation here of, of the gamma value is about half of the gamma in the normal state. So uh, uh, let's put a pin on this. Uh, because this is a in interesting question. I'm going to get back to this uh, later on in the talk. Uh, where, where is this um, Sommerfeld coefficient coming from? And finally, there has been also in, in this original um, or the first paper, uh, NMR measurements on, on tellurium. And here's the night shift as a function of temperature. And um, I should say that these uh, measurements are um, done in polycrystalline samples and there is no um, anomaly in the night shift as one goes through TC, which is an indication again that this is a spin triplet superconductor. Uh, I also have to say, however, that uh, measurements, more recent measurements on single crystalline samples actually see a finite um, decrease in the night shift below TC. Okay, so this was, was my first slide uh, on our introduction slide on uranium tellurium 2. I have to say that um, more than 80 papers have been published uh, on this material after the, the, the discovery, and I, I cannot go over all of them, but I'll go over um, uh, a lot of them. Okay, so finally, uh, actually, let me tell you that also the upper critical field is, is very large. Here, it, there is an isotropic and for parallel to be it, it's just um, much much larger than the poly limit or the paramagnetic limit which again indicates that this is a spin triplet superconductor. So let me uh, tackle my, uh, mystery one uh, which is that of multiple uh, superconducting phases 
And again, there are a lot of um, studies under pressure in this material, and I cannot go over all of them. Um, um, I have here a representative one. Uh, there are many others listed here. Uh, this is the temperature pressure phase diagram. At low pressures, we can see uh, a, a superconducting state. And uh, at about 0.3 GPA, it seems that that state uh, splits into two. Uh, one transition goes up in temperature, the other one is suppressed. And it's important here uh, that these measurements were done um, by Braithwaite and, and, and others uh, using AC colorimetry, which is really important. Otherwise, you would not be able to see the two transitions because the resistance also always goes to zero at the higher uh, transition temperature. So you have just a zero resistance state. So here's the AC colorimetry data. And you can see that um, at zero pressure, there is a single transition. Uh, um, and, and then that transition sort of splits into two at point, uh, let's say 0 0.25, 0 0.3 GPA, and they have opposite pressure dependencies. So when, when we saw this, uh, uh, there were several questions that came up and, and two of them I'm, I'm gonna pose here. Um, how do the transitions, these two transitions at, at high pressure extrapolate to zero pressure? Uh, do we have two transitions even at zero pressure? And what happens in this region here uh, at around 1.5 GPA uh, when it seems that uh, possibly magnetic order appears? So let's try to answer these questions. Uh, so these, these are data uh, collected at, at Los Alamos National Lab. Uh, here at first, oh, there, there's my cursor now. Um, uh, so now we have here heat capacity at ambient pressure. And actually, if you uh, perform a pulse in the a pulse sequence in the in the sample, or if you even collect uh, lots of, of uh, data points, you, one can actually see two transitions even at ambient pressure. I should mention that, that this is sample dependent, and again, this is something I'm going to uh, come back to uh, later on. Um, however, uh, we believe this is intrinsic. And why is that? One reason is that uh, under applied pressure, here is that now AC colorimetry versus temperature at various pressures. Now this little transition that was TC1 here with very small entropy at low, low temperatures, it moves to higher temperatures and uh, its entropy is enhanced under pressure. Whereas TC2, which used to be the high temperature transition, moves to lower temperatures and its entropy decreases. So again, it seems that we're seeing just an evolution of the two transitions at ambient pressure that actually compete with each other. So we worked with Rafael Fernandez and his uh, postdoc Morton to just write down a phen phenomenological model for this system. Here's the free energy for, in, in this case, we have an orthorhombic material. So all the uh, irreducible representations of this order parameter, they have to be one dimensional. So we have here two one dimensional order parameters, psi one and, and psi two, and they compete with each other. And in this simple, fem, like nothing microscopic here, in the simple model, they predicted that the uh, heat capacity, the sum of the heat capacity jumps, the, it, it has to actually be constant. If pressure is only changing TC or, or in, in a more technical term, just the uh, uh, quadratic terms in the free energy. And that, that is indeed what we see here. This is the experimental uh, sum of the heat capacity, and it's pretty much constant at low pressures. And you can kind of see this with your naked eye. As, as one transition loses entropy, the other one gains entropy, right? Uh, but at higher pressures, this is not the case anymore. And that's probably because uh, the system is getting close to a magnetic instability. And in fact, at around 1.47 GPA, we see a, a, another bulk peak here uh, that, again, is probably related to magnetism, though we do not have um, uh, a measurement of the magnetic structure through diffraction, for example, yet. 
But let's take it for granted for now that this is magnetically, uh, a magnetically ordered state. What, what's interesting here is that when this peak shows up, the um, bulk TC is different from the resistive TC. So this is a, a very strong indication that they're competing uh, with each other, magnetism and superconductivity. This peak here is also much broader and at one, just slightly uh, higher pressures, 1.49, we cannot even see a, a clear bulk sharp uh, transition for the superconducting state, but we can see still a zero resistance state. And this really is, is very interesting and it, it reminds us of something that uh, Los Alamos likes a lot. So let's uh, see what that is. Uh, here, um, let me tell you now what the phase diagram looks like uh, from, from the data I showed you in the previous slide. This is the pressure, uh, oops, I'm giving the answer already. Uh, this is the temperature pressure phase diagram and you can see at low pressures, we, we have two transitions, they cross around 0.2 GPA and um, at this point here, PC1, uh, the extrapolation of the magnetic phase uh, goes to zero. This is just a guide to the eye. And at PC2, uh, when the two coexist, we can see a difference between TC from the bulk and uh, from AC calorimetry and TC from resistivity. And around, let's say, the, uh, well, PC1, we see a um, region in resistivity is shown here at the bottom uh, of, of linear resistivity. It's a small region, but again, it resembles a lot serum rhodonium 5. And this was pointed out by, by Joe Thompson that uh, the, the phase diagram of uranium tellurium 2 is a mirror of that of, of serum rhodonium 5. And in fact, um, there is also a difference in this coexistence region between TCs determined by resistivity uh, and, and magnetism, or resistivity and heat capacity. So in fact, in this coexistence region, uh, these are um, critical current measurements. The critical current is tiny. At 1.57 GPA is of the order of milliamp per centimeter squared. Uh, whereas at ambient pressure, we have kiloamp Per centimeter squared. So we have here almost six orders of magnitude uh, decrease in, in, in the critical currents in this coexistence region. And finally, I would like to point out that at higher pressures, there are two transitions, not only one, but two. And, and why were we calling them AF1 and AF2? Well, because first, having two bulk transitions is not consistent with having ferro a ferromagnetic state. If you have ferromagnetism and then you change it to some other ferromagnetism in another orientation, you should see just a crossover because they have the same symmetry. But the fact that we have two bulk transitions here is our first indication that we have an antiferromagnetic state. And in, uh, in addition, uh, if you look at the resistivity at high pressures, the, the resistance at, at this transition, uh, AF1 or TM1 or TM2, uh, the resistance actually increases at the transition. And this is also inconsistent with a simple ferromagnetic order. Um, remember or recall that Fischer -Lang the Fischer-Langer relationship uh, tells us that the derivative of the resistivity with respect to the temperature has to be proportional to heat capacity. Heat capacity is always positive, so this should be positive for a ferromagnetic uh, transition, for example. So either we have to revisit Fischer-Langer uh, relation, the Fischer-Langer relationship, or we have antiferromagnetic order, which seems to be um, um, a, an easier solution, let's say. I also would like to draw another, uh, oh yeah, I should note that we're not the only ones uh, uh, mentioning that uh, antiferromagnetic um, interactions or transitions, uh, they are important. Um, Aoki and others also pointed this out with high field measurements, which unfortunately I don't have time to get into. Uh, we'll focus on the pressure tuning instead of the field, magnetic field tuning. Another uh, parallel I would like to draw is, is that of, uh, is with uranium ruthenium to silicon 2. 
In this case here too, uh, we, in the temperature pressure phase diagram, we see the uh, superconductivity is suppressed and uh, magnetic order uh, occurs, which is, again, uh, it, at first it's not very intuitive because you think the pressure will actually increase hybridization and it will make, the will make the system go away from a magnetic instability. But in this case, and in the case of uranium tellurium too, that is uh, not really happening. And I think that in both cases, they, they share the same origin for this behavior. Let me go through that. Um, this is particularly uh, important uh, in light of very recent uh, results by Andrea Severing's group. So they have done an elastic X-ray scattering as well as hard uh, X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy to show that in the series here of uranium transition metal to silicon two systems, uh, as, as one goal, uh, goes from palladium to iron, the, F, the 5F shell filling is enhanced. So as you go from palladium, which is antiferromagnetic, to iron, which is just a vegetable, a paramagnetic system, uh, it, the system is going from a more 5F2 to a more 5F3 uh, configuration. So in the Doniac phase diagram, iron is here to the right, is in a fermi-liquid state, and palladium is to the left, and it's in the antiferromagnetic state. So uh, the reasoning here is that the 5F2 configuration actually is more localized. So we have smaller interac exchange interaction J, or you can also think of a higher on-site Coulomb U, for example. So when we have iron, we have a higher or a lower F2 configuration, so it's more delocalized. So and we go to, when we go to palladium, we have a higher 5F2 configuration, and it's more localized, it's antiferromagnetic. And in, we believe that that's exactly the case for uranium tellurium too as well. And in fact, we have performed in collaboration with Gilberto Fabris at, at APS at the uh, Advanced Photos Photon Source uh, Synchrotron, uh, Zane's measurements in the L3 edge of, of uranium. And we can see here that uranium tellurium too, which is the black uh, curve is between uranium F4 and uranium cadmium 11, very similar to uranium ruthenium 2 silicon 2. And under pressure, there's actually a shift to higher energies, which means that the system, the, the F electron is going towards an F2 configuration. So again, uh, at ambient pressure, we have an intermediate valent uh, compound between 3 plus and 4 plus. And with pressure, we have a higher 4 plus configuration. So higher 4 plus is um, closer to 5F2, more localized, it orders magnetically. So let me uh, briefly now go over the two outstanding questions. Uh, the first one is the order parameter. I wanted to point out very quickly a couple of um, band structure calculations. So this is DFT plus U uh, uh, calculations. And here you can see in panel C the, the uh, energetics of the various configurations. And you can actually see for a higher U, which, which in our case means pressure, um, the ferromagnetic configuration becomes unfavorable, actually. So this is, again, an indication uh, from calculations that antiferromag the antiferromagnetic state may be indeed, uh, uh, may be occurring uh, at high pressures. Uh, and, and another thing to note is that even though uh, we, have an, we may have an antiferromagnetic ground state, the dimers along the c-axis always have a ferromagnetic configuration um, for the low energy states. Uh, things that will get a little bit technical for the next couple of minutes, but bear with me. Uh, so again, this is an orthorhombic material. Here are all the irreducible representations that the order parameter could have. The first four are, are singlet um, order parameters. The, the, the uh, bottom four are um, triplet states. In a very recent uh, study here with a tight binding model and a periodic Anderson uh, lattice, this is really fresh from earlier in, in August. 
they calculated here uh, the, vari the various possibilities for the order parameter. And they actually see that under pressure, the AG uh, singlet uh, state may be favorable. So we may have a mainly triplet state at ambient pressure, but a mixed, even an odd parity state uh, under pressure. And this here is their uh, phase diagram in panel A for uh, flight pressure. Things are not so simple though. Uh, there is a catch here. So again, let's, let's recall uh, the possible ERAPs. And we know that the order parameter has to have two components, right? We have uh, been talking about two uh, transitions. So we need to choose two of these. Uh, but there are also polar curve effect measurements, which are field trainable along the C-axis. So a finite curve below uh, TC, below the superconducting transition temperature, is an indication of time reverse asymmetry breaking. So we need a phase between the two uh, order parameters. Also, I, I haven't mentioned, but there are thermal conductivity measurements that show that there are point nodes along the A-axis in, in particular. This is the reference here. So if we combine all of them, so if we combine two components, uh, with time reverse symmetry breaking and uh, field trainability along the C-axis, the, the only choice really, you have to choose two triplet states and to, to go with uh, a field along Z, which is the B1G configuration, the only choice is B3U plus IB2U. So to me, there is an outstanding question here. There are all these amazing theoretical proposals for the order parameter, but they do not agree with each other at the moment. So I do think this is an outstanding question for, for theory. The second outstanding question is for experimentalists. Uh, there is sample dependence here. And as usual, uh, sample quality is, is something very important to take into account. There is this mind-boggling result uh, by Aoki and others uh, in which for uh, samples grown by chemical vapor transport, this is the blue curve, uh, there is a nice clear superconducting transition, but samples grown by the flux technique by excess tellurium, they have absolutely no superconducting transition. Um, another uh, very nice example by Huxley's group they changed uh, the uranium tellurium ratio in the growth, and TC changes a lot. You can see here in panel C, uh, their various samples have a spread of TC, uh, in particular compared to the, those of the literature. And they indicate that TC uh, goes with uh, an inverse, inverse uh, relationship with, with the low temperature heat capacity gamma we talked about in the beginning, so the higher the TC, the lower uh, the, the gamma is in comparison to the normal state one. So this, you know, it, one can think that naively if you can uh, increase TC to its highest value, the gamma will actually be very small. And finally, I should note that one of their samples, for example, C5 has a bulk transition at 1.7 Kelvin but a resistive transition at two Kelvin. So all of those things we, we really need to understand. This is a material science problem that is really very interesting. Okay, so let me finish by thanking my collaborators. Without them, this work would not be possible. In particular, in this cast team, Atlanta, Sean Thomas was really uh, driving this, this measurement under pressure to very low temperatures of 100 millikelvin and he was very uh, patient to do those very small pressure steps to understand what was going on. Fred, uh, he's a, a PhD student at the University of Sao Paulo. He was here in Los Alamos for a year for an internship. He grew a lot of those samples uh, that were used for the measurements. Uh, Morton and Rafael uh, uh, performed the uh, phenomenological calculations, and Gilberto at APS did those really nice uh, Zane's measurements uh, under pressure. And finally, uh, I would like to mention that at this CAS uh, team here in Los Alamos, we're, we have several postdoc um, positions actually open right now. So if you're interested, please send me an email. Here's my email. And I would like to thank you very much for your attention.
Okay, so I, I would like to ask the audience to unmute the microphones for a second so we can give, give Priscilla a nice round of applause. Okay, thank you very much. So now the presentation is open for questions. So please raise your hand using the raise your hand feature if you have a question. And people in the Facebook can ask the questions using the chat. Pasqual, I cannot raise my hand, but I have a question. Okay, yeah, you are a co host. <laughs> so please go. On, please. Um, so I raise my hand. Hi. Priscilla, um, well, very nice talk. Thank you very much. And uh, very interesting um, work. So you mentioned about uh, the problem in knowing about anti ferromagnetism or ferromagnetism. Uh, measurements uh, of magnetic structure are underway or it's hard because of temperature and even I know that I think at NIST they can do it under pressure. Is there any do you know? Right. So um, Gilberto actually was uh, planning on performing XMCD measurements, for example, mm. just before the shutdown, right? Yeah, I know, but uh, is there any, sorry, I think that Jeff is in the audience. I don't remember if you run your telerun is okay for neutrons because it's going to be easier, no? Uh, yeah, neutrons. I know that, that Nick Butch and, and probably Jeff is, is much um, more um, aware of this than I am. Uh, that he's looking uh, at uranium tellurium too with neutrons, but maybe maybe if Nick is in the audience or maybe Jeff, uh, if you have anything that you could share with us, I'm personally I'm not um, um, looking uh, at at this with neutrons. We're focusing on X-rays. Okay, but is there any indica indication <coughs> of um, um, order parameter for from X-rays, not yet, anything not from there? Yet. Not yeah. yet, yeah, because again, Gilberto was able to get the data I showed you before and yeah. he had to shut it down. So, but things are coming back to, to some sort of normal now. And, and these measurements are definitely um, going to be performed in the, in the near future. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I guess I could comment that uh, this Go material ahead, Jeff, please. is perfect for neutrons. This material is very good for neutrons. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. So, Thank you. Alicia, do you have a question? I see that you have a video or uh, mic. Yes. Please uh, go ahead. Well, uh, concerning the other parameters, you, you talk about singlet and triplet. It's a uh, spin orbit coupling included is singlet and triplet. Uh, Total angular momentum or just spin? Uh, is, the, is that the uranium state or a more global state? Right, I mean, so, so that's a good question. Some of these reports, they do consider spin orbit coupling, but I think, and I could be wrong, but I'm going to say this anyways, I think this particular work here may not have taken spin orbit coupling into account. So an open question may be how spin orbit coupling will change all of this. Okay, thank you. Can I raise my hand? I have a question. Okay. So, yes. Who is next? I can, Keenan, you have a question? Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, please. Oh, uh, a question about the uh, uh, you touched on it earlier. We want to decrease the night shift along with the axis. Uh, do we know anything? Uh, do we know anything about the spin part of the order parameter? Like, we know very little, um, but we like is it constrained to is it constrained to free to move in a polite field? Ah, that is a good question, and I don't know if if that is 
that is um, settled yet. Maybe if, if we have someone from the theory side in the audience. I think that's still an open question. Cool. All right. Thanks, Priscilla. I guess we'll have to wait for the sequel. Yes. So, okay, we have another question from uh, APG1. I don't know the name. You, you just raised your hand, so please go on. Unmute yourself. I cannot read the name. APG1. <clears throat> I have a question. I mean, this is Kenshin Dai from, from Rice University. Go ahead, please. Yeah, okay, so, so you have the stability dropping or, or not dropping. So at zero field, the, are there actually two, I mean, you said there are probably two transitions, right? So, so when you see stability drop, I mean, don't, doesn't that uh, indicating actually a singular component instead of a triplet component? But it's not a, a pure singular component, right? Because if it were, then the night shift should go to to really close to zero. This is a very tiny drop. We're talking about a drop from 5.6 to 5.5%. So do, do people know the directional dependence of this drop? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe, I can't remember now. Uh, let's see. You mean if if uh, field uh, was applied along other directions? Yeah, different directions. I mean, you have A, B, C directions, right? Right. So I'm looking at the paper right now, and uh, it seems that uh, it it it's only with H parallel to B, and um, for H parallel to A, it's actually important possible to measure because of the very strong fluctuations uh, that exist in this material. So the short answer is we don't know. Again, we need more information, right? I agree, I agree completely and that kind of touches on Keenan's question too. Uh, having the, an isotropy of this measurement would be really great, but so far uh, it hasn't been done yet, especially with field parallel to A. It, it is just, it's um, um, not possible at the moment. Thank you. Can I? Can I answer your question? Yes. Go ahead. Yes, I, 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 yes, I have a question. Uh, just on the page, I, he, uh, I, I can see from the heat capacity, uh, seven Tesla data, is that one normal state one or is not yet? Because otherwise the entropy is not conserved here. Yes, that is a very, very good observation. The entropy is not conserved. So this likely means that there is something else hidden at low uh, temperatures. That's one possibility. Or that, uh, and this has been done by, by uh, Oki and, and others, um, maybe you have a gamma that is not really linear, that is not really uh, constant. You have something that changes, perhaps because of the proximity to uh, a magnetic instability, you have a background that is not linear. So I think there are at least two possibilities, maybe there are more, uh, but you're completely right that the entropy is not conserved. Okay, thank you, thank you. Can I make a statement on that? Yes, please. Hi, very nice talk, Priscilla. Thank you. Um, so, we in our thermal conductivity paper, METS et al., we, we also have the specific heat data there down to 100 millik. And so you didn't mention much about this, but there's a strong upturn at lowest temperatures, which we're still trying to understand, but it's certainly not due to itinerant carriers. At seven Tesla, that is normal state, and it's pretty much flat, but there's still some indication of an upturn at the lowest temperature. So there's something there that's eating up some entropy. And in fact, when we did a fit, to this upturn, just some kind of power law, and you subtract it, you can actually balance the entropy pretty well. So there's something there that's, our guess is that it's magnetic. There's still a possibility that it might be a nuclear shock key, but 
we're fairly sure it's not because we've looked at isotopically pure samples that don't have that. So there's something there and we, we're not sure what it is. So thank you, Pagliani. So we have a question in, in the chat from Tamizael from TIFR Mumbai. And his question is the crescents used, the crystals used for these studies are grown by vapor transport or flux growth? By vapor transport, yeah. It seems that the vapor transport grown uh, samples are um, more likely, let's say, to have a superconducting transition. Okay, thanks, Priscilla. So we have the question again from someone named APG1. That's a name that appears for me now. So could you please unmute yourself and make the question? So maybe I can have the last question then. So you compare the, to the UT E2 with the 115s in terms of the phase diagram and the proximity of magnetism and superconductivity. We know that the crystal field ground state in, in the 115 case may be important for superconductivity. I wonder how do you compare that with the uranium which has a different J in both cases, even if the J equals four or J equals nine halves, so the, the wave function involved in that would be quite different. So how, how do you compare those two with contributions? Well, but that's the same thing with, with your uranium ruthenium to silicon too, right? And I can give you my perspective right now, but I, I wish I had the crystal field fits to good enough to, that I could show them here. But what I think is happening is that, again, the localized state here is from uranium-4+, plus, which is 5F2, five, uh, five right? So you have actually a singlet ground state, but a, a, a first excited state that is really nearby. You know the story, right? So then you have a quasi-doublet. Oh, but do you have, do you have a, a guess how near is it in temperature? So from my uh, not so good crystal field fit so far, uh, there is a range of temperature. It could be anywhere from 10 Kelvin to 40 Kelvin. So okay. it's close, it's as close as, so ur for uranium ruthenium to silicon two, is at what, 35 Kelvin, right? So do you think it's a, a hybrid hybridization induced doublet like state then? Yeah, uh, hybridization or, okay. you know, uh, the, the, the J or the U, uh, they're, they're very large. Yeah, so. Thank you. So any, any further questions? Okay, so let's unmute, unmute everybody mics again. And thanks, Priscilla, with a nice round of applause. Hey, thank Bye. you very much, Priscilla. So we, we should move for the next. So please, Stephen, welcome. So if you could share our screen and start, please. Does that look okay? Yes, please yes. go ahead. Great. Okay, firstly, let me thank the organizers for inviting me to speak today. This presentation is about superconductivity in doped ferroelectrics. I'm very happy to be given the opportunity to share the approach that my colleagues and I have taken on this fantastic, fascinating topic. <clears throat> Let me begin by thanking co-workers who have greatly contributed to this endeavor. I would particularly like to thank Carsten Enterlein and Jaime Oliveira for assisting with the measurements and Gil Lonserich for working on the theory. Our experimental and theoretical projects were carried out in Cambridge and Rio. Our research on ferroelectrics and strontium titanate began nearly 20 years ago. Some references to this work are listed here. Before considering the charge carrier doped ferroelectrics, it's helpful to remind ourselves of the insulating case for displacive systems. 
The phase diagram here shows the Curie temperature being suppressed to absolute zero by a quantum tuning parameter G, which could be pressure, isotope exchange, chemical substitution, or uniaxial stress. <clears throat> the phase diagram is based on calculations using the self-consistent field theory for ferroelectrics with soft transverse optic polar phonons <clears throat> in three dimensions and a dynamical exponent z equal to one. The model demonstrates quantitative agreements with experiments without adjustable parameters. The green quantum critical regime is characterized by a susceptibility and Gronison ratio diverging as one over t squared. The gray paraelectric region at low temperatures is described as a quantum polar elastic. It involves a hybrid state of coupled polarization and strain fields. Many ferroelectrics are actually semiconductors <clears throat> with band gaps comparable to silicon. Mobile charge carriers can be introduced to ferroelectrics by several methods. These include chemical doping and electric field injection. In the sense that we mean it here, a ferroelectric transition within the metallic state would be an inversion symmetry breaking polar distortion due to a Q equals zero soft transverse optic phonon. Such an example is shown by STEM scans of electron doped lead titanates in the left panel. Here we can see the displacement of an ion in the unit cell resulting in a polarization as indicated by the blue arrow. On the right side, we can see the, the polar metal states observed in electron doped barium titanate. As the charge carrier density is increased, the Curie temperature is gradually suppressed, as well as the magnitude of polarization fluctuations in the paraelectric phase. Doped STO was the first of the oxide superconductors discovered in the 1960s. This led to a rich development of superconductivity research in oxide materials, including the cuprates. The figure here shows the superconducting transition temperature as detected in the resistivity for niobium doped STO. The fact that superconductivity occurs at an, at an accessible temperature range for such a low charge carrier density indicates an incredibly strong attractive interaction between electrons. During our early work on ferroelectric quantum criticality, as referenced here, we considered from the beginning the possibility that pairing might originate from ferroelectric critical modes. However, it wasn't straightforward to find a solution, and this began a long search of the theoretical literature and new experiments. This slide shows the effect of hydrostatic pressure on the superconducting transition temperature in high purity single crystals of SDO near to optimal doping. The measurements were taken using a magnetic solid state refrigeration system, providing a base temperature of less than 50 millikelvin and extended earlier work. Hydrostatic pressure allows the phonon frequencies to be varied without introducing inhomogeneities, as can be the case with chemical composition and strain tuning. What is remarkable here is the complete collapse of superconductivity within a few kilobars. This is over a range in which the band structure and Fermi surface are practically unchanged. We can also see in the inset the well-known dome of superconductivity as a function of carrier density with, with optimal doping around 10 to the 19 to 10 to the 20 carriers per cubic centimeter. Note that niobium doped samples that are the subject of this study are only superconducting in this range and not below 10 to the 18 carriers per cubic centimeter. <clears throat> Given these uh, striking experiments and those of many other groups, how can we understand superconductivity in strontium titanate? Having investigated a large body of the literature, we selected to approach the problem using the dielectric screening model within the random phase approximation. This very much builds on the foundational work of Gorovich and Larkin, and Fursov from the 60s, and Takada from the 80s. The interaction between two electrons in a doped dielectric 
can be written as shown here. It depends on the wave vector and frequency dependent dielectric function epsilon. Rewriting it on the right hand side in terms of the dielectric susceptibility chi shows how the interaction comprises a direct Coulomb repulsion term between electrons denoted by the one and an attractive term involving chi. <clears throat> As shown on the second line, the dielectric function comprises a contribution from the ionic oscillations characterized by the plasma frequency of the ions, capital omega P, and the transverse optic phonons, omega Q, and a second contribution, chi electron, which involves the Linhard function for the conduction electrons. On the third line, we see how one over epsilon appearing in V can be rewritten in terms of two new resonances defined by omega minus and omega plus. Physically, omega minus and omega plus are the new longitudinal normal modes of the coupled conduction electron and polar phonon system. They are defined entirely by in the terms of the quantities above. The interaction between electrons V can be plotted as a function of frequency as shown here for parameters relevant for STO. The longitudinal hybrid polar mode frequencies, omega minus and omega plus, are clearly visible. Omega minus can be thought of as the conduction electron plasma mode as screened by the ions, and omega plus can be thought of as the ionic plasma mode as screened by the electrons. Attractive regions can be seen close to the hybrid polar mode frequencies, which increase as the transverse optic phonon frequency is tuned to zero. This slide shows the same function in imaginary frequency as employed in, in our calculations. The interaction shows two steps at different imaginary frequencies. The larger the step size, the greater the interaction between electrons and which one of the two steps dominates depends on the position of the Fermi energy. By focusing on a single pair of modes, as we see in this simple illustration, we can understand some of the key points about this interaction. Even though there is no direct coupling to the transverse optical critical modes, we can see that um, the range of attraction here increases as the transverse mode frequency is tuned to zero, as well as that the repulsive part up here also decreases as the, as the optical frequency is tuned to zero. As shown in the lower figure, this is visible in the imaginary frequency representation relevant to the Ali-Ashberg equations as an increase in the step size. This principle remains in the more complete version involving multiple modes as referred to earlier. To see whether the dielectric interaction model has a chance to generate superconductivity, we need to solve the gap equations as shown on this slide from the we start with the in the weak limit appropriate for frequency and leads to the so-called KMK kernel as referenced here. Uh, from this, we can estimate TC. The result for TC is shown here, demonstrating its variation with pressure and carrier density as calculated by the model. The parameters are determined by independent experiments in the zero temperature limit. A range of values for the energy cutoff in the gap equation have been considered, which are similar in order of magnitude to those suggested by the recent work of Wolf. We can see here that the model recovers the rapid reduction of TC as pressure is applied and the dome as a function of carrier density in agreement with experiments in niobium dope samples. Note that the phenomenon of retardation is included in our calculations in two ways. <laughs> Firstly, within the frequency dependent interaction V which involves two hybrid polar modes, one above and one below the Fermi energy. Secondly, retardation is incorporated within the gap function that changes sine as a function of frequency to avoid recursive parts of the interaction. 
These two retardation effects greatly assist the formation of a superconducting state. Based on our own experiments, we can bring the measured data together in a combined temperature quantum tuning parameter phase diagram, as you can see here. This may be further expanded into a multidimensional phase diagram as further data is included. Our model and experiments indicate that superconductivity is, en is enhanced close to the ferroelectric quantum critical point at optimal doping, even in the absence of a direct coupling between electrons and the ferroelectric transverse critical modes. To summarize, we have found from experiments and theory that superconductivity in SDO appears to be substantially mediated by longitudinal hybrid polar modes. These are the normal modes of the coupled itinerant electron and polar phonon system. The largest contribution to superconductivity in our estimates do not come from transverse optic critical modes, but rather from longitudinal hybrid modes. Superconductivity is observed within our model and experiments to be enhanced around the ferroelectric quantum critical point at optimal doping in niobium doped samples. Curiously, at lower doping levels, the opposite behavior is found within the model, namely that TC is suppressed close to the quantum critical point. This is in agreement with predictions of Ruman and Lee 2016. Superconductivity in quantum criticality and ferroelectricity are strongly tuned and controlled by voltage gates and strains in a wide range of dielectric devices. Doped ferroelectric semiconductors perhaps open a new frontier to explore within the field of strongly correlated electron systems. Thank you very much for your attention and I welcome any questions. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Uh, so the presentation is now open for questions. Please hand your hand or unmute yourself if you want to make a question. So Steve, perhaps I can start. Could you please go back to the phase diagram? Which one, this one? Yeah, mm -hmm. this one. So do we have a, a niobium doped sample? And so, so how do you compare the, the, pre the chemical pressure with the actual pressure, uh, applied pressure? How do you compare the, the niobium so, doped pressure with pressure. Can you scale those two yeah, so contributions? The way, this is actually a bit of a, this red line is really a, a projection onto the temperature quantum tuning parameter axis. So the niobium doping here doesn't move left and right on this diagram. It's actually an orthogonal axis, which is introducing um, uh, charge carriers. So this is, um, if you like, this is a little bit just in front of the plane. And um, the ch when the charge carriers are introduced to the lattice, they feel a very strong interaction by the polar modes from, the, from this quantum critical state. And that's what causes them to get paired and forms a superconducting state. I see. But, but can you associate uh, a specific doping, not neobial doping, with a particular pressure point? Yeah, exactly. So this one that I'm showing, showing here is around 2.2 times 10 to the 19 carriers per cc. Um, and if I go back to the, yeah, here you can see this is the, this is the uh, niobium doping here, which is tuning the carrier density. So there's a dome is it, in this direction. Makes sense. Thank you. And you can, you so can, we have you, a can question. you can move, you can also use chemical substitution to tune through the quantum critical point, but that would 
instead of niobium doping on the on the titanium site here, it would be um, something else like uh, calcium replacing strontium, for example. Okay, thank you. So I can see that we have a question for Robert Cava, and he's asking, is there a documented effect of disorder in this system? Um, well, <clears throat> that's a very good question. And certainly in the, in the oxygen reduced strontium titanate, which is the other way to our carriers, um, it's very, very um, unclear that the, that would be done in a homogeneous way. So we believe the oxygen reduced samples are probably quite highly disordered and which may explain some of the reports of superconductivity at very low doping levels in, in, in oxygen reduced samples, which are absent in the niobium doped samples. Okay, thanks. Any further questions? I don't see any further questions. Okay. Daniel Konsky, please unmute yourself and ask the questions. Daniel? Yeah. For very low doping, uh, uh, Fermi energy is uh, probably uh, comparable or smaller than characteristic energy of your uh, effective funnels or effective uh, excitations transferring interaction. What could be the consequence of that? So yeah, I've got a slide here, is it this one? Yeah, so this shows the Fermi energy as a function of carrier density and the two key... What's comparison of Fermi energy with your omega? typical omega plus minus yeah that's it's this still point. larger or smaller so the fermi energy is slightly above this mode omega minus and it's slightly below this mode omega plus and the the um the range the optimal doping range is around here 10 to the 20 so you can see that from this figure here how so important is below, is, uh, how important is it theoretically i mean um, well, you can see, for example, um, let's have a look at, say, yeah, so we did things, if, if this omega plus gets very, very high, then that may have some issues, but our intuition really breaks down, and um, we would say you really need to solve the, the gap equations to get a feel for what happens. But um, what comes out of the calculation is that even though this omega plus is a little bit above the Fermi energy, um, uh, omega minus is still below, and these two modes actually do seem to produce a superconducting state, which recovers the trends that we observe in pressure and carrier density. So can I say that uh, uh, mainly uh, excitations below Fermi energy do contribute to pairing? And to those above, uh, don't or what? No, I, I think you need both. So you really, we really find that you would need both the one above and the one below. And um, which one is more important depends on the on the the Fermi energy itself. So when the Fermi energy gets close to the upper one, that one becomes slightly more dominant. When it gets close to the lower one, that one becomes slightly more dominant. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Daniel. We have another question in the chat from Fabricio. Uh, perhaps he missed it. Is there any orbital order in Stronson Titanium Option 3? Orbital order. Um, not that I'm aware of, no. So the ferroelectric state is due to the physical displacement of ions. And um, the, the electron liquid state is a very simple metal with a small Fermi surface. Okay, thanks. We have another question in the chat. How do you confirm that niobial doped samples are not oxygen deficient, which may cause superconductivity? 
Well, you can make, for example, a very low dose, uh, small concentrations of niobium and superconductivity is absent. And then you can also make higher concentrations of niobium and superconductivity is absent up, up here and down here. So if there was a background concentration of oxygen vacancies, we would expect not to see this dome structure. Okay, thanks. And but you can also check that with m many different characterization methods. Okay, thanks. Any further questions? So I don't see any further questions. So I would like to thank you, Stephen and Priscilla again. Thank, thank all of you for joining us today. And before we finish, so Steve, could you please stop sharing the screen? And, and I would like to ask audience to turn on the videos so I can have a nice screen, screen of all the participants, please. Okay, that's perfect. Thank you very much for joining us. I hope to see you next time. Stay well and healthy. Take care. Nice seeing you all. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye. Yeah. Great.